I'm Melody Russell. You're watching Asked and Answered. Thanks everyone for watching Asked and Answered. Today we have the pleasure of interviewing Professor Neil Gotanda. But first, before we get started with the interview, if you like this series, if you like what, you, what you've seen and what you've heard, click that smash that like button and subscribe. So let's get right into it. So Professor uh, Neil Gotanda, we, I mean, it is, it is a huge pleasure to have you today. And let's just get right to the first question. The first thing I'd like to ask you about is please talk about your background in terms of um, where and how you grew up. And also please discuss your educational path, uh, which led to you becoming a lawyer and a law professor. All right, well, it's um, not a straight line. Um, uh, I was born and raised in Stockton, uh, California in the Central Valley. Uh, a town which has gone through um, uh, several different kinds of notoriety because it's a uh, farm town in the, uh, and, and that was its basic function was as a, uh, 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 for the agricultural produce uh, at production in California. It was also featured, it had, as it always had, uh, uh, extreme, not extreme is not the right word, but poverty. So it, Michael Harrington's ancient book called The Other America there's a whole several pages on Stockton, California and it's Skid Row and it's uh, poor areas. Um, so that's, you know, but it's also a, a very nice community to grow up in and was had a very large Japanese American, by, by community standards, a, a large Japanese American community before World War II, uh, smaller after World War II because of the evacuation and the camps, um, but a significant population came back as did my parents. Um, and so I grew up and went to Edison High School uh, in Stockton. It, it was a semi-segregated uh, town, uh, two minority schools and one pre predominantly white school uh, on the other side of town. And then um, I was a real smart kid. So I, I was able to go to Stanford as an undergraduate and I was going to be a scientist. Um, I, I went to Stanford a, as your standard Asian American geek. Uh, I, I was going to be a, a physicist and I had my um, um, awakening moment when I went to a, a, a science uh, exhibit about the what became the Stanford Linear Accelerator, Proton Accelerator, I mean, Electron Accelerator. Uh, and they were talking about a project where they were still working on the experiment and hoping that it would become, they would get results in five to 10 years. And I was a sweet little freshman kid and I said to myself, I'm not waiting around. <laughs> for those results. So I ended up drifting away from science. Um, and then this is in the middle of the Vietnam War. So this was the years of uh, demonstrations on campus. This is the 60s. So I started in 1963. And so there were uh, you know, major demonstrations on campus and student strikes. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, that was an important part of my being politicized. Uh, and so then because of the war, because of the threat of the draft, Again, this is this for, for my generation, um, the draft was, uh, and the war was um, very much, the Vietnam War, gotta remember how, which war, um, the Vietnam War was um, always present. And so I joined the Peace Corps, um, which offered a deferment on the draft, um, went to West Africa, spent a year there. Um, and the, uh, the political sense of, um, I didn't belong here, and by that time I'd had enough political reading to say to myself, I'm a neo-colonial agent, even though I am teaching uh, uh, mathematics in a, uh, in a school in West Af in Sierra Leone. Um, so I ended up quitting after a year and coming home, uh, managed to get a medical deferment, uh, and so was not drafted and then went to law school. Um, and as my friend, a friend that I, and as an undergraduate, we would sit around talking about what to do about the draft. He said, well, I think I'm going to go to law school, which had never occurred to me because I was raised with the Japanese American, you'd become a professional and professions did not include lawyers. 
Um, and uh, no, that wasn't the normal path. And um, he said, well, because there's nothing better to do. There's nothing else I can think of to do. And by the time I got back from the Peace Corps, uh, managed to, as I said, get a draft deferment, worked as a computer programmer for a couple of years. I said, oh, that sounds about right. So I went to law school, um, got into Berkeley, uh, and, um, you know, became a, what then joined, what, what became the Asian Law Caucus uh, with friends who were then going to law school, a, uh, which has emerged as one of the leading uh, Asian American public interest uh, uh, legal groups. Um, uh, and then um, um, at some point was uh, seduced by the question of race. And uh, I had a mentor, um, uh, um, uh, a Korean ex expat refugee who was a Marxist scholar, uh, Harry Chang, uh, and I studied race with him uh, uh, and um, uh, ended up then drifting off uh, after law school and uh, uh, was seduced by uh, a group of other intellectuals who uh, eventually became critical legal studies and then critical race theory. So long answer, but th th there's of course other stories along the way, but that's, that's how I got into it. And critical, the important thing is um, uh, critical legal studies. That is to say the leftist, the left formation within uh, legal academics. Uh, and it was there that I met the people that uh, uh, became a, a central part of what became critical race theory. Thanks everyone for watching Asked and Answered. If you like this series, if you like what, you, what you've seen and what you've heard, smash that like button and subscribe.